All right. We're going to wrap up the day with our very own Henry Lazenby. I've referenced him a couple of times today with that story on the latest developments in Chile, such an important country in our global mining industry. And good to see that things are seem to be heading in the right direction. He is going to be sitting down for a fireside chat with Dr. Aaron Bobicki, who's been a former guest on the show, got such a positive response. We wanted to have her back and she agreed, which is fantastic. So let me introduce Henry though, and Henry will take care of the further introductions. Henry is a journalist. He has over 10 years of experience heading up North American focused resource news desk for different multinational media houses. He's originally from South Africa. Back there, he was an award-winning community journalist before he went into the B2B market, then came to Toronto, Canada, and ended up staying in Canada. He's now residing in Vancouver, does frequent visits to exploration sites really around the world, specializes in covering North American and international mineral exploration, mining, and also metals markets. Consistently turning out great stories for the Northern Miner, Henry. Great to have you back on the Global Mining Symposium. I will turn it over to you and you can introduce Dr. Aaron Bobicki. All right, thank you very much for the kind introduction, Anthony, and for another opportunity to moderate a featured presentation for the Global Mining Symposium. It's my pleasure to introduce an industry research heavyweight, Dr. Erin Bobicki. Erin is an associate professor of mineral processing in the Department of Chemical and Materials Engineering at the University of Alberta. Professor Bobiki's research interests include microwave applications in mineral processing, comminution, bioreagent development, the rheology of complex mineral slurries, and value recovery from waste materials. She has worked as a researcher and plant metallurgist for Vale, as a process technology development engineer for Intel Corporation, and most recently was an assistant professor at the University of Toronto. Uh, she is currently commercializing microwave technology for the mining industry with Sepro Mineral Systems. And she is a founding director of Aurora Hydrogen, a startup developing technology for emission-free hydrogen production. Erin is joining us today to discuss the hydrogen piece and its place in the energy revolution as well as how miners and explorers can take advantage of this emerging green technology. It's a pleasure to have you with us today, Erin. Welcome. Well, thanks, Henry. It's a pleasure to be here, and thanks for the kind introduction. All right. Um, <laughs> so I want to get us started by asking you to explore, uh, to share with us a little bit more insight into your extensive background uh, in the research field and how your research into comminution and mineral processing led you to the exciting and emerging world of hydrogen. Well, I feel like you, you, you gave some of the pieces away there in, in my bio. <laughs> um, so let's, I, can, I can go back to a few of those things. So most people I think within this venue know me as a miner and mineral processor and so might say, you know, what, what business does she have in, in hydrogen? And it's really, uh, for me, been a very natural path. Of course, I started out in, you know, R&D and operations with Valet. Um, but even while I was there, you know, very passionate always about environmental sustainability of operations and particularly reducing water and energy use. And when I went back to school and became a professor in, in, you know, in academia, my focus of my research program has always been on, on these pillars, reducing water and energy and, and mineral processing. And, you know, even way back in the day when I was working on my PhD and the focus of my PhD was um, storing CO2 in ultramafic nickel tailings actually, um, but looking to make those tailings more reactive to CO2. And one of the things that I um, explored was microwave treatment, converting the serpentine to olivine, um, which, which is much more reactive CO2 using microwaves. And so that got me down the path of how we can use microwaves, which are a very efficient way to transmit energy to material to improve mineral processing applications. And that, you know, bench scale work, um, you know, went on for many years. And in the past uh, couple of years did a scale up project 
um, with Sepro as part of, and you know Glencore and CMIC as part of the Crush It Challenge. Um, we built a you know a microwave pilot plant could run up to a thousand tons per hour of ore that that pilot plant is still being used for testing and we actually won the Crush It Challenge. We won the five million, so that was really exciting. Um, but through this process, really built up a strong knowledge base of materials and how they interact with microwaves and how microwave equipment um, can be compiled and utilized at an industrial scale in an efficient way. And a couple of years ago in 2020, in the depths of COVID, another professor from U of T actually reached out to me, he, Professor Murray Thompson. He's an expert in combustion and pyrolysis, and he was looking for an efficient way to get heat into pyrolysis reaction. So this is where you take methane and natural gas and you directly crack it to produce hydrogen and solid carbon. And if you look at the thermodynamics, this is actually the lowest energy wave, requires the lowest enthalpy of any of the process paths to produce hydrogen. So if you look at steam methane reforming or electrolysis, requires far less energy to do pyrolysis, but it, you need a high temperature. And so Murray knew that Microwaves are a way to get energy into materials, and he reached out to me to figure out how to do it. And so he presented me with the problem. I recognize that the carbon product um, is a very effective microwave absorber. And so we developed the process for um, that, that we're commercializing through Aurora. Um, so, you know, down the garden path, demonstrated the technology, created the company, filed the patent. Um, and so now I am CTO of, of Aurora Hydrogen. I'm still a professor, but I'm actually on leave. Um, I'm not teaching any classes this term, just uh, supervising grad students and building a pilot plant uh, for the process in Port Saskatchewan here in Alberta. Excellent. Well, that wasn't a, indeed a mouthful. Uh, I guess that's really <laughs> set the stage for the rest of our discussion. Um, so as noted, uh, it is starting to become evident that hydrogen will play a big role in the next phase of the energy revolution. Um, would you please share with us, you know, where do you see it fitting into the bigger picture that encompasses everything that's green and sustainable? Mm -hmm. Well, there's certainly a lot of excitement around, you know, hydrogen and uses for decarbonation, but I would even take a step back and just say right now, there's a huge market for hydrogen in industrial processes. So here in Canada, particularly, and in Alberta, um, you know, there's a vast amount of hydrogen that's used, you know, 90 million tons a year globally um, for, you know, primarily, so about 45% uh, is that hydrogen is for hydro treating, upgrading heavy oil. Um, the other 45% is for ammonia production, for fertilizer, and then there's 10% other uses. So there's actually a lot of hydrogen used and consumed today, and decarbonizing that, those processes and producing clean hydrogen is important for many um, industries um, currently. But then, you know, to your point about, you know, path to net zero, Canada has, and many other company or countries have committed to achieving net zero carbon emissions by 2050. And hydrogen, and I agree with this, has been identified as a key pillar um, on, on that path. And the reason is that, you know, electrification is suitable for, for many things, um, you know, passenger vehicles, for uh, example. I mean, there's Teslas on the road everywhere. We had a lot of talk about Vancouver this morning. Every time I go to Vancouver with my daughter for hockey tournaments, we play the game, count the Teslas. <laughs> <laughs> They're all over the place. So it's clearly very effective for passengers. But where a chemical fuel is desire is desirable, hydrogen, you know, fits the bill in many respects. So things like long haul transportation, you know, when you need assets uh, available, um, you know, most of the say 24 seven, um, you don't have time to stop and charge for a period of time um, when you want to be hauling goods instead of weight. So if we look at long haul trucking, trains, uh, shipping, you know, batteries um, are very, very heavy. And so if you're, you know, hydrogen has been identified as a better fit for the decarbonization of those industries compared to electric vehicles. And then space heating as well. I mean, Canada is a cold climate, most of it, maybe Vancouver aside. And so we use natural gas to heat our homes and natural gas blending with hydrogen um, and eventually looking to uh, replace a lot of the natural gas that's that's used with hydrogen is another you know key way to decarbonize many of the industries. So it's not you know hydrogen you know not all applications, but where electrification is not a great fit. Mm -hmm. All right. So so 
that being said that you know hydrogen is really useful in the uh, on the route towards a net zero how far are we really from realizing any you know tacit and and uh, measurable you know um advances and, and you know the uh, along the implementation of this technology in any of these myriad of applications well you know a lot of the technology that's available for hydrogen production or high or I should take a step back so hydrogen you know production is a very um advanced industry it's been done for I don't want to say 100 years, but, you know, steam methane reforming where hydrogen is reacted with uh, hydrogen or sorry, methane and natural gas is reacted with high temperature steam to produce hydrogen. That process has been utilized for for many, many years. The problem is that it generates a lot of CO2, you know, so nine kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of, of hydrogen. Um, that's a problem. Um, it's also, you know, primarily centralized production. So if you want to, let's say you're operating a mine in Chile off grid somewhere or, you know, wherever, you don't have access to a, a, a hydrogen pipeline and SMR. The other, the other thing is that, you know, that CO2, what are you doing with that? Are you emitting it? If you want to decarbonize, you need to capture it and you need to store it. Um, so you need access to geologic storage. You need to pipeline that CO2 somewhere. And really, geologic storage is not available in a lot of areas of the world. Here in Alberta, there's there's quite a bit of it, some in Saskatchewan. But if you look in many areas of the world, there's there's not. So that's the main way. I mean, hydrogen production technology by SMR, very well established and mature. But, you know, problems with, with transportation of that hydrogen and the CO2. You know, another, another um, way to generate hydrogen is from water via electrolysis. This is also a mature technology, although less mature than, than SMR, I would argue. Um, it is, though, very expensive, very energy intensive to break the bonds between oxygen and hydrogen in water. Mm -hmm. um, and so this process uses it, you know, it, it's very expensive. It's not accessible for everybody. If you were making hydrogen via electrolysis for hydro treating, for example, I don't know how much money you would make selling, selling the petroleum products, for example. Um, you know, so, so you can produce, you know, localized hydrogen that way, but very expensive. Also very water intensive. You need the water for the process because you're making hydrogen from water, mm -hmm. but you also need uh, desalinated water. So you need, you know, X amount of that, that hydrogen. Um, so there's this, this gap in the market for low cost distributed hydrogen. I'll get to that in a sec, but it, you know, you also asked about, you know, the maturity of technologies, maturity of technologies for uses. Um, so fuel tech cell technology has been around for many, many years. Um, you can also do uh, dual fuel. So you don't necessarily need a fuel cell to use hydrogen in a vehicle. You can blend it with diesel. Those engines are commercial. You can buy those. Um, in addition, you can blend up to 5% hydrogen into natural gas um, without much of an issue and use it in most of, you know, home appliances that are available today, 5% and up to 20% actually. And so there's a number of pilots that are going on to do that. So I view the gap, you know, really as this, you know, lack of low cost distributed or decentralized hydrogen production. And so that's actually what we're trying to do at Aurora. It, we're developing a technology to produce low cost distributed hydrogen with no CO2 emissions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so just to continue your point, um, how, do you, how does Aurora plan to distribute this? And how do you plan to really crack this distribution piece to the question? Well, what we do, so, so I'll take a step back. I was talking about the, you know, the different pathways as I was, you know, steam methane reforming and electrolysis. Um, and I was talking about how Murray Thompson, my collaborator from the University of Toronto that developed the technology with me, he's a pyrolysis expert. So our process is a, is a methane pyrolysis process. So we use methane and natural gas. So that's our main feedstock um, to produce hydrogen. So we directly crack that methane to produce hydrogen and solid carbon. And the way that we do this is we use microwave energy. And so because we use microwaves, it's extremely efficient. Um, so the conversion of electricity to microwave energy at the industrial frequency of 950 megahertz is about 90%. So that's a very efficient conversion. And then the way that we um, transmit this energy to the methane to crack it is actually via the solid carbon. So we have 
the solid carbon product, it's a, it's a sand, it's a granular material. We have it in a fluidized bed reactor, actually. So many of us in metallurgy are familiar with fluidized bed reactors. So this carbon in a fluidized bed reactor, we have natural gas containing methane. So it's most, natural gas is mostly methane. Um, coming in the bottom of the reactor, fluidizing the carbon sand, we bring in microwaves, that carbon sand gets very hot, very quickly, and that heat is transferred to the gas phase, cracks the methane, hydrogen comes off the top, and the carbon grows on the surface of the existing carbon particles until they're sufficiently large that they can be removed from the reactor. So it's this very efficient way to produce hydrogen that allows us to do it at a low cost. And because it's microwave technology and it's fluidized bed technology, it's very scalable and it can be modular as well. So, um, you know, our models that we can produce hydrogen at the scale required where it's required using the existing uh, natural gas infrastructure. So natural gas pipelines to bring the, the hydrogen molecules via methane to the site where you wanna make the hydrogen and then the electricity using existing electricity infrastructure to bring that to site and generate hydrogen at the scale you need it, where you need it. So you don't need hydrogen pipelines, you don't need CO2 pipelines, and you can do it in a way that is accessible from a, an affordability perspective for, you know, I would hope anybody. Yes, that makes a lot of sense and you make it seem so easy. So <laughs> well, you know, it's actually a very elegant and simple process. I mean, when we were going through the initial fundraising, we just recently closed a series A for the company, um, to, to you know, commercialize the technology. And that was a lot of the questions, like if this is so easy, why did nobody else think of it? I don't know. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. All right, so now we know how to make hydrogen and mm -hmm. where to make it. So you've spoken a little bit about this uh, in the lead up to, um, you know, to our conversation, but just uh, what kind of applications would be interesting to miners and explorers alike? You know, why would they want to embrace hydrogen and any of the myriad of technologies that it's suitable for, you know, today and perhaps even down the line, you know, where do you see miners really benefiting from the hydrogen piece? Mm -hmm. Well, for, because, you know, my background is mining and mineral processing and our third co-founder, Andrew Gillis, his back, he's also a mining engineer. We talk a lot to mining people. <laughs> and so this is one of our key interests. And I mean, today, a lot of hydrogen is used in the metallurgical side of things, right? So we're partnering with uh, Share It. Um, they're one of the sponsors of a research program that we have. They use hydrogen on site at their facility in Port Saskatchewan for um, uh, 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 in their nickel refinery for reduction of lateritic nickel ores, for example. So used extensively in metallurgy. From a mining perspective, it's very interesting for um, heavy vehicles, uh, fleets, for example. So we've had conversations with you know, mine sites in southeastern BC, for example, that are exploring hydrogen from a decarbonization perspective, but also from a cost perspective. I mean, with the cost of diesel today, you know, hydrogen starts to make a lot of sense, particularly, I mean, hydrogen is, you know, has three times the energy density that diesel or gasoline does, right? So if you can get around this problem of um, you know, hydrogen transportation, and if you can generate on the site at a low cost, then, you know, it becomes very interesting, not just for decarbonization, as I said, but for as a cost cutting measure, right? Mm -hmm. So I know that a lot of mining companies right now, you know, um, looking at electric vehicles and electrification underground is becoming, you know, um, I would say popular and very interesting, but uh, I would encourage people to, to consider hydrogen for fleets and heavy vehicles as well, because then you don't have to do, you know, the charging and you're not hauling around batteries. You can use the energy to actually haul ore, for example, or, or concentrate. Um, you know, there's other, other mobile equipment that could be useful as well. There is the potential for remote power generation, right? A lot of our mines in Northern Canada and elsewhere in the world rely on diesel power. Mm -hmm. And so this is another area where um, depending on the price of diesel, and, and, and that's high right now, and the price that, you know, let's say Aurora can produce hydrogen, um, that could become interesting from an economic perspective um, as well. And then, yeah, you know, yeah. you look to, oh, sorry, Henry, I was going to say you look to 2030, 
and you know the Canadian government, but other governments are talking about it as well, carbon pricing, mm. right? And if you can access a say $170 per ton carbon credit um, for you know using hydrogen versus diesel or something else, then that could be that could be very interesting as well. Mm -hmm. All right. And then uh, basically from the regulatory standpoint, how would you characterize Canada's um, policy at this time? You know, is it supportive of this emerging technology to commercialize it? I would say supportive, absolutely. Um, so, that, I mean, if you talk about policy, there's, there's the supporting and programs, and then there's the regulatory mm -hmm. side, right? So from a, you know, a policy perspective, there are a ton of funding programs available in Canada, particularly Alberta, but in Canada more, you know, largely available to support the development of hydrogen technologies, to support demonstrations. There are people coming to us every day, you know, we have this new program, multi-million dollars. So, you know, certainly if companies are interested in doing a, a hydrogen demo on their site, not necessarily with our technology, but there's funding available to do that. From a, a regulatory standpoint, I mean, there's certainly all the safety protocols are in place. Like we, as Canadians, we are world leaders in hydrogen utilization and handling because we have some of the largest hydrogen producers and consumers um, in the world right here in, in Canada. Suncor, for example, Syncrude, these, these folks, you know, massive amounts of hydrogen that they deal with every mm -hmm. day. Um, you know, in terms of carbon credits and carbon pricing, um, you know, we have these, they have, you know, I would say aspirational goals and saying we're, we're going to have this $170 per ton carbon, but, you know, getting there, that, that picture to me is a little bit fuzzy. And then, you know, regulatory on different ways of storing carbon. So there is in Alberta a protocol for credits for CO2, but not solid carbon at this time. So these are things, you know, and we talk about it and certainly I don't get any pushback. Yeah, that's a great idea, Aaron. We just don't have the things in place yet. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, uh, basically along the same vein, um, for people who are not really familiar with the technology yet and its current state of play, um, would you, um, they would argue that, you know, the, the hurdle to entry and to adopting this, in, this uh, technology is still too high or too expensive or uh, disproportionately adds to the risk profile of a, you know, non-cash generating project still. Um, what would you say to those uh, people? And, you know, what's the key thing that they don't understand about this new technology? Yet? <laughs> well, you know, as a developer of technology, I, I don't think I'll ever be successful in convincing somebody to do something that's that's more expensive than the existing technology. So, you know, from my perspective, it has to be cost competitive and ideally drastically undercut <laughs> the you know existing technologies. That's what we're we're trying to do. I would say if we're looking at Hydrogen utilization technologies, those are mature. You can buy the, you know, hydrogen engines from, from Cummins, for example. You can mm -hmm. buy hydrogen trucks today. People are using them. There are a number of demonstrations for long-haul transport that are occurring right now. There's natural gas blending occurring in the world. You can buy appliances to run on natural gas. Or, uh, sorry, on, well, definitely on natural gas, but also on hydrogen. So I would say the technology for consuming it is, is there. Um, there's also mature technology for producing it. I mm. think where the rubber will hit the road for a lot of, uh, a lot of folks, particularly within mining, is, is the cost of diesel and then the cost of hydrogen. And if I can make that, you know, one third the cost of diesel, then I think that's pretty, pretty compelling. And if that doesn't come out in a risk assessment as something worth trying, especially after we've demonstrated on site here in Alberta, um, I would say your loss, but, uh, you know, for me, you know, it's gotta be, it's gotta be cost competitive. Mm, no, that makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. Um, so just in general, um, are there perhaps any other interesting trends regarding hydrogen and emerging applications or, you know, in the generation of it that, you know, we should talk about that we've not uh, touched on yet? Uh, emerging trends um, in hydrogen uses, I think one of the ones that's really interesting for me is steel making. Mm. Um, and that's directly related to our, inter our, our industry, right? Um, a lot of the players that are that are mining are also involved in either in supplying products for steel making or involved in steel making itself. And so 
the industry is actually actively moving to the adoption of hydrogen. There is a hydrogen-based process that has recently been commissioned in, in Europe. So this is real. And the folks that I'm talking to, for example, out of the Hamilton area, they're actively moving to hydrogen-based processes as well. So we're gonna we're gonna see that. And you know, there there will be, I think, adoption there. Um, probably of some more conventional hydrogen production technologies to start. Um, mm. But move, you know, they're looking for, you know, CO2 free or greener ways to make hydrogen as well, because if you replace one process with, with hydrogen, but the hydrogen is associated with a heavy carbon footprint, then, then that's not um, particularly interesting. Um, yeah. But, you know, what I, what I, I think I'd like to drive home is that this, this industrial use of hydrogen I mean, this is a big market today and decarbonizing that industry is going to get us a long way. And the learnings from, from that can be directly applied to other things like, like fleets. I, I really see mining fleets as a very interesting um, application, quite frankly, particularly for our process. So I've been talking about this solid carbon that we make, right? We make mm -hmm. um, hydrogen and we make solid carbon. The solid carbon from our process is quite interesting. It's like a carbon sand and it has a lot of interesting applications. So you could, it is, so we talk about steel making hydrogen for steel making. You could use the carbon for uh, steel making, not as conventional Coke, but in the green steel process, you still need carbon from, for metallurgy um, in the Flomey slag, slag process. It's very interesting for that, but it's also very interesting as a cement additive to displace, you know, limestone and therefore decarbonize that you know, cement manufacturers, well, in road base, asphalt, and even as a reclamation material. So this is not the sexiest application. People say you just want to bury it. But, you know, regulatory environment is making that really interesting. We're getting a lot of push and like a lot of interest in that from, from the states, um, actually, with this new uh, legislation that's come down there. Um, you know, if, if carbon prices are very high and you can put carbon back in your mind, let's say you're a coal mine, and you've been digging coal out for years and years and, you know, the regulatory environment is not supportive of mining of coal anymore. Although, of course, I think those of us in the industry know the prices are pretty good right now and companies okay. are making a good living doing that. But if you can put carbon back in the ground and sequester it, you know, you could be looking at things like $600 a ton just to put that carbon back in the ground. Yeah. Um, so that's very interesting as as well. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of talk to be had from an ESG standpoint as well. With the exactly, engine. exactly. I think it's an excellent story for miners, mineral processors to tell. You know, we're exploring these low carbon hydrogen technologies and investors, I think, are very interested in that today. Mm. So I'm seeing one risk factor here when it comes to like the, the uh, hydrogen uh, fuel cells and it's mm -hmm. Extensive reliance on platinum. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me like the two major producers of platinum are not the greatest of jurisdictions at the moment, you know, and the West certainly does not want to do business with one of them at this time. So um, what are your thoughts on perhaps reducing the reliance on platinum down the line? Is that even a possibility um, when it comes to the transportation application? Mm -hmm. Well, a couple a couple things I'll say, you know, a lot of people have disclaimers when they put up, I am not an expert in platinum or markets or risk or geopolitics or anything like that. But what I will say is that as, you know, a professor, I'm involved in a lot of different research and seeing what other people are doing. And there there is very active research into, so I was saying fluid fuel cells are mature, they are, but there's a lot of active research into improving those. I mean, platinum is mostly used as a catalyst in these, in fuel cells, right? And so there are many different um, things that you can use as, as catalysts. So I don't, you know, platinum might be what's commonly used today, but I know that there's very active research going into replacing platinum with, with other things, not just other precious metals. So that's, that's one piece. Um, the other is that you don't necessarily need a fuel cell to use hydrogen in transportation, right? So I was talking about these uh, blending type, these, these mm -hmm. direct dual fuel and blending applications where hydrogen can actually be blended into diesel. So it doesn't mean necessarily using 100% hydrogen, although that would be the, you know, the lowest carbon option, but you can decarbonize your fleet and your transportation by blending hydrogen into the diesel as well. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, one way that, uh, you know, you could 
have a fairly low platinum based transportation application. And of course, you know, hydrogen, it, it's a fuel. It is, as I mentioned, the most energy dense liquid fuel, 120 megajoules per kilogram. And so it's, you know, just, you know, multitude of ways of harnessing that energy, just like there are for, you know, gasoline, diesel, et cetera. So, mm -hmm. you know, ongoing research in the area, looking to different ways to, to use it. And that's just the fleet application, right? There's still the heating, the power generation applications that don't rely on fuel cells. Yes, yes. All right. Well, uh, at this stage, I'd like to invite uh, panelists and attendees to submit any questions for uh, Dr. Bobiki uh, at this time by using the Q&A icon on your screen. Uh, while we wait for perhaps a few questions to populate, um, I will, I'm just thinking about Europe and the impending energy crisis there. Um, we're seeing some reports of perhaps, you know, uh, you know, the, the, the Nord Strom uh, gas pipeline being sabotaged, etc. unconfirmed at this point. Um, do you think at this early stage that hydrogen could perhaps uh, offer a solution to, you know, the, the Europeans uh, going into winter at this time? Well, at this time versus, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, it is certainly a very different story. I mean, pre, you know, prior to, to the, the war in Ukraine, um, a lot of Europe was looking very interesting for, for pyrolysis. We were getting a lot of interest from that area. And to your point around energy security, natural gas pipelines, it's, it's certainly pyrolysis, I think, is, is much less interesting to many jurisdictions there because the uncertain supply of, uncertain supply of natural gas. Um, and mm -hmm. so a lot of Europeans are looking more at uh, electrolysis and green hydrogen at, at this time. So, so that is tricky. I mean, we'll see what happens. Liquefied natural gas is another potential. So for example, uh, Asian countries like Japan, South Korea, they rely heavily on imported liquefied natural gas. Um, so that's not Europe, but you know, that, that, the situation could evolve at some point um, where, you know, if, if Europe is not receiving natural gas from, you know, places where it historically was, then they could look to use not uh, liquefied natural gas. Mm -hmm. um, liquefied natural gas is very interesting from, for our process from the perspective is that it's pure methane. And so you get a 100% pure hydrogen product, which is excellent for transportation. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've got one question that came in from the audience. Uh, mm -hmm. Farid is asking um, you to perhaps just elaborate a little bit more on what uh, the key roles of PGMs really are in green hydrogen. That's a, that's a tough one for me because I'm not an expert in electrolysis. <laughs> All right. So I know that they, you know, there's, there's certainly a number of different, um, well, there are precious elements used in uh, electrolyzer production, but I can't tell you the, the ins and outs of it. Mm. Okay. Well, a, a, couple that, here, yes. a couple over here, a couple over here, Aaron. Uh, one, okay. one thing that miners do like about their diesel trucks is with that, that higher compression in the diesel combustion engine, thicker steel, reliability, right? I mean, a diesel engine yep. is known for lasting a little bit longer than a gas engine. What, what about hydrogen engines? Is there that same, dura, I guess, more durability than reliability is what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Do we have data? Is it too early in the game for that? Or do we are they going to be as durable as diesel engines, more or less? It's a very good question. I would love to do some demonstrations at some mine sites to see. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't, you know, I'm not aware, and it doesn't mean that it, that it hasn't occurred. I'm not aware of a mine site operating on hydrogen to collect that data at this time. Um, from what I've heard from the um, um, demonstrations that are going on right now with hydrogen for long haul transport is that there are many similarities between you know, the operation and reliability of hydrogen um, trucks as opposed, you know, compared to diesel trucks, but I feel like it's pretty early in the game to, to comment on, on the long term. I'd love to get a, you know, a mechanics perspective on that, for example. Maybe we'll circle back on that one. It's such a great conversation. It really has so many far-reaching implications for the industry. The other one I'd get you to maybe, if you want, to throw in at, we've seen in the public domain a bit of a back and forth between Andrew Forrest of Fortescue and, uh, and Elon Musk. Elon Musk saying, 
hydrogen's the dumbest thing. He, his, his point seems to be it's on the energy it takes to actually create the hydrogen, which you've addressed, and to liquefy it and transport it. Uh, Andrew Forrest's rebuttal is that, no, it's the dumbest thing to plug in a car if it's coal that's generating <laughs> the power that's that's making you feel good about a, being a, a green person driving a car that's actually coal-powered. Um, can you provide a little bit of context on that? Who's, I think there are two bright individuals. Both have built tons of value, and they're diametrically opposed on this. Give our audience your take on who's right, who's wrong here, and why. Well, I think both of them are talking from a place of feeling as opposed to a place of fact. So it's like when we were at the PDAC conference and there were people placarding outside mining that kills babies. And I'm thinking, you know, I have five babies and mining's been really good to them. And we use a lot of products in our house that keep them alive. So, but let's, let's get down to, okay, so if we're talking green hydrogen, so we're trying to get away from the colors because it doesn't really reflect the carbon intensities, but green hydrogen is typically electrolysis. Right? right. So if we look at standard electrolysis processes, it's it's 193 megajoules per kilogram of hydrogen. So a heck of a lot of energy. So that's so for perspective, our process is 35 megajoules per kilogram of hydrogen. So it's a lot less energy to make electricity from natural gas than it is from water. But we talked briefly that it, it's based on the thermodynamics. So if you're going to make hydrogen from water, yeah. It's going to be it's going to be extremely energy intensive to do that, and right now all of the technologies that are out there um, for hydrogen production, aside from electrolysis, which is very expensive, required centralized production where you do need to compress it and pipeline it. So hydrogen might be the most energy dense liquid fuel, but it is very difficult to compress. If you look at the periodic table, it is the lightest element, so it does require a lot of energy to to um, compress. On the, the other side of it, so let's talk about, yeah, it's dumb to plug in your electric car. I mean, if you were able to access green electricity, you know, electric battery, battery electric vehicles are, are quite good for short jaunts around the city, right? I have a plug-in hybrid Pacifica, and in the summer, I don't fuel up. You know, it's wonderful, but the vehicle is heavy, and so actually, today and you know getting into cooler days people talking about rain in edmonton it's a beautiful sunny fall day in edmonton it's supposed to be 27 this afternoon but it was four degrees this morning and when it starts to get cooler it's it's not as efficient right so that that could be an application but it's these these heavy haul right so it's not one technology fits all so for you know transportation Hydrogen makes a heck of a lot of sense for long haul applications for heavy haul like we talked about. We might see commuter vehicles running on hydrogen. I don't, I don't see that as an economic application today, maybe at some point in the future. You know, I really see in terms of transportation, battery electric works very well for commuters. Hydrogen is more, you know, at your card lock, for example. You go to the UFA, you fill up your, your big rig and you drive to Flintlon or wherever you're going, you know? Um, to address this, you know, hydrogen compression electrolysis, that's that's really what we're trying to do with our technology and not to, you know, wave the Aurora hydrogen flag too much. But yeah, hydrogen compression, storage, CO2 pipelines, all of this is a is a huge issue today. And so if we can generate hydrogen with a little, you know, far less electricity um, where it's required, we don't need pipelines. Um, I didn't mention that our process does run, can run under pressure. So one of the big costs of hydrogen is depressurizing natural gas or taking water, making the hydrogen and then repressurizing it, right? That's a huge cost. If you can make the hydrogen at natural gas pressure, because it's actually relatively easy to compress natural gas and then not have to recompress it and go on your merry way, you, you solve a lot of those problems. So I try to save the world here, making <laughs> low cost hydrogen where it's required um, to, to make it available for applications where it makes sense, which I don't think is every application, but certainly, you know, where a chemical fuel is required and to, you know, let's not lose sight of these large industrial applications where we're already using, you know, 90 million tons of hydrogen per year that is primarily produced via steam methane reforming and generating nine kilograms of CO2 per, per ton of hydrogen. So decarbonizing the industry and using hydrogen where it makes sense. Excellent. Well, I love that we had an ESG panel today about making actual practical decisions, making ESG real. And then we end off today. I mean, we can't get more practical than this. 
Aaron, so great to have you back, giving us a real technological solution to a big problem, and it has far-reaching implications for the industry. So thank you so much for joining us. Henry, wonderful job as always conducting the interview. Cheers to both of you. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks, Henry. Bye. Thanks both. Bye-bye.